Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Banking Matters. I'm your host, Daniel Baker. Joining us today, we have Jennifer Waller. Jen was named president and CEO of the Colorado Bankers Association in January of 2022, after serving as president for two years. Jen joined CBA in 1999 as the senior vice president responsible for state government relations and banking advocacy. In 2016, she was promoted to chief operating officer, accountable for the daily operations and management of the association. Prior to joining CBA, Jen, the daughter of a community banker in rural southern Colorado, worked at her father's bank in Pueblo following high school graduation. Then, armed with some banking experience and knowledge of Colorado banking laws, she soon sat for the state bank examiner certification and spent five years as a bank examiner for the Colorado Division of Banking. Like so many leaders in the banking industry, Jen gives back to the community through her participation in numerous civic and educational programs. She's a trustee for the Graduate School of Banking, Colorado and Madison, a financial advisory council member for the Colorado University Lead School of Business, and she serves on the boards of the Colorado Civil Justice League, Compliance Alliance, Common Sense Institute, Imagination Library, Society of State Bank Executives, and the Western States Director of Education Foundation. Jen enjoys politics and volunteering for campaigns, and she is passionate about lowering the number of unbanked and underbanked people and communities across Colorado, as well as advocating for more diversity and inclusion in the banking sector. Jen, welcome to the episode. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So Jen, I always like to ask, you know, we got a little bit of it in your bio, but how did you get started in the banking industry to begin with? It, it really was in my blood. I mean, my father um, was a banker the whole time I was growing up. He was mm -hmm. a small town banker. He had me and my two brothers sit in on board meetings, um, attend various banking functions, so we would be well prepared. Um, one brother is a professor, another banker, another brother is also a banker. Okay. So, so it's yeah, it's, it's definitely in the DNA then. <laughs> it is, absolutely. So, uh, were you primarily sent to, so something you don't know about me is I actually lived in Colorado for a few years. I lived in, in Springs and Fountain, and my wife is actually from southern, southern Colorado, a little place called the San Luis Valley. I'm sure you've, yeah. you've heard of it going through Walsenberg and, and everything down there. So are, did you did you grow up in Pueblo? Is, is Pueblo is Pueblo home for you? That's where I went to high school. I mean, okay. I was originally born in Texas. So I'm still a oh, Texas girl. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I went to high school in Pueblo. We moved uh, around a lot. I lived in Springfield, Colorado and Buena Vista, Colorado, Hayden, Colorado. So always okay. small towns. Well, I, I love Colorado. Colorado is a beautiful place. It's it's definitely a, a gorgeous area. So the Bankers Association, are you based out of Denver area, Springs area? Where, where are you centralized? We're in Denver. We're very close to the capital. Our office is about four blocks away. Perfect. Makes makes great sense. I mean, you want to be, be nice and close there for everything. Yeah. Unfortunately, so then, we spend a lot of time there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you do, especially during session and everything. I'm, I'm sure you right. get back and forth quite frequently. So then I have to ask, how did your background really prepare you for your, your current role? Because I mean, in your current role as president and CEO, you're overviewing a lot of responsibility in Colorado. What, what kind of experiences have you developed throughout your career that, that really led you to this position? So it's kind of funny. Um, my dad was also very political and always involved mm -hmm. in campaigns. So I kind of get my love of politics and banking from my dad. Um, attended lots of functions, was a bank examiner, and then I took the job at CBA in 99 as a part-time job, yeah. thinking I would run for the legislature and okay. I needed to get some exposure. So I actually joined CBA thinking this will look great on a resume <laughs> and then I'll be gone and I'm going to run for office or something. And yeah. I just fell in love with it. Um, very passionate about the industry. I always say, if you think of every positive in someone's life, like when they get to purchase a home yeah. or buy a car or put a kid through college, all those things we as bankers get to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very passionate. It's very, very exciting to me. Um, and to be able to be a voice for that industry is really quite an honor. So I fell in love with it. I've been here 25 years now and will never leave. Oh, that, that's fantastic. I love that concept of, of being very passionate about it because you're involved in so many parts of, of people's lives. Like, I can't say I necessarily directly correlated with like weddings and, and, and school and, and, and all these different things, but you're right. I mean, that's that's exactly how, how this connects and how this works. So I do yeah. want to ask you, you one more question. You, in your bio, it mentions that you're, you're really passionate about 
helping lowering the number of unbanked and, and underbanked people in, in communities across Colorado. How does that, that passion manifest itself? What, what do you do about that? Well, I, I serve on the bank on, I used to serve, actually, I just had someone else take mm-hmm. my place because I'm serving on too many boards now, but on <laughs> bank on um, Denver and bank on Boulder. And now we have a kind of a statewide bank on um, function through our attorney general's office. The so CBA is engaged in that. In, in Colorado, and I don't think we're unique, there's a big challenge. We have uh, a lot of, of immigrants who have mm-hmm. a natural distrust of banks yeah. and a distrust of government. So banks telling them they need to open an account doesn't really help and they right. may not have the right documentation. So it's really a focus on getting people, what I call bankable, getting them ready and getting them comfortable with a banking system um, because without a banking system or access to financial needs, they can never excel, neither can their family. So let, let's say then we have like a present of a, of a small bank, one branch bank kind of thing listening in today. Uh, what, what piece of advice would you give them to help with these communities? How, how, how can they reach out to these communities? Is it just I, I, being involved on a state level or is there something that they can do? I think more of a local level. I mean, the state level kind of coordinates, but nothing beats that local level and getting involved with community service groups and, and helping be a voice for the industry through there and explaining how banking, um, I call it, you know, kind of banking for good, what yeah. we can do yeah. to help the community as a whole. Um, but you build that trust by participating in those community groups. I love it. I think that's great. So I know Colorado has kind of led the way in in some unique elements of of the law, especially when it comes to things like like marijuana banking and and cannabis and and that that whole whole field. Uh, Were you in I'm based on the the years here, you were in CBA, you were involved in this process, right? Would you mind telling me a little bit about the background behind how the Colorado Banks Association handled this this transition in this this interesting time? Yeah, so it's kind of crazy. So um, the voters passed medicinal marijuana in 2000. Then we passed recreational in 2012. It went into effect in 2014. Right. Um, we were not supportive of the ballot measure. We were kind of agnostic. Um, our um, It's now Senator Hickenlooper was governor at the time. He was not supportive of it. A lot of concerns about, about the societal impact of legalization. Mm-hmm. Um, But once it passed, we wanted the industry to be able to serve any legal business in our state, including marijuana. Um, We had lots of banks just dive in, open tons of accounts, and then they were visited by regulators um, Mm -hmm. quickly and given usually 60 days to close those accounts. Um, and, And usually it wasn't in writing. Usually it was more of what I call a verbal threat. Um, one banker that I know personally was told he would lose his FDIC insurance oh. if he did not um, close all the accounts. Mm-hmm. We also had DEA agents come out and visit oh, bankers um, and, and the bank commissioner. And the DEA agents explained that not only was it a, a violation of federal law, but the violation would pass down to the teller that accepted the funds. Oh, And so it really kind of put the fear of God in bankers, because um, basically DEA was explaining how they would look in orange. Basically, it was, it was not, you get handcuffed, dragged off, two coat over your head, the whole works. Yeah, it was not a friendly, friendly conversation. Um, so we had a few banks that really kind of pushed the envelope on that a little bit. And, and now we have quite a few banking it. But it was extreme. Like if you had a couple and one individual had a, a I'll say, traditional job, another one worked at marijuana. You could not take into account that marijuana funds, the income base from a marijuana right. industry to approve a mortgage or a car loan or anything. Um, if you had a strip loan, a strip mall loan where you had a marijuana tenant, um, originally regulators were calling that loan due. Mm-hmm. You had to either get the tenant evicted or um, call the loan. The Interesting. Right. Yeah, it was it was a little bit crazy. They relaxed quite a bit now. Okay. Um, often, like for strip malls, um, they're allowed to still have the tenant, but you can't base your repayment Off on that. that. Right, right, right. It has to float without that income. So then how do you see law enforcement really getting involved nowadays? Or is it more of just like a, hey, look, the, the fad has passed. 
and now like the industry has more established itself. What, what, what do you see on that side of things? I, I haven't, DEA has stopped visiting us. So that's awesome um, that we don't have drop bys because that was intimidating <laughs> as all get out. Um, you don't really see much from, from law enforcement anymore. It's, it's really relaxed now. And I think that's because so many states. So we were the first state right. to pass recreation. The path, right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that everybody kind of calmed down a bit. And a lot of the fears we and others had about societal impacts um, didn't come to fruition or didn't come to fruition at the rate we expected them to. The right. sky did not right. fall. So then I know that there was that there was that big initial moment, like everything's legal. Everybody's like, yeah, jump on board. And then they, they, they open all the accounts. You said the regulars came in and say, Hey, you, you close these out and now. And so they close out. And then everybody, I'm assuming like, not everybody, but like banks started step-by-step step, kind of gradually increasing the exposure to, to what they're, they're doing and how they're, they're handling these, these processes. Cause they have a better idea of what to do in this. So how did the legislatures handle all this? What did they do to the address the, the, the lack of financial services for this industry? So they tried to help, in air quotes, help, okay. <laughs> which a legislature trying to help you is always a really dangerous thing. It's an interesting um, game, yep. Yep, so they, they created a um, kind of a marijuana bank in Colorado that okay. would be a standalone entity. Um, we It was never created. Two, two inst institutions applied, but they had to have access to Fed. Otherwise, they were just a big vault right. and still a cash-only industry. Yeah. Um, so that bill passed. We saw several, several attempts to create kind of a state-owned bank, but mm -hmm. only for marijuana. So we saw one mm -hmm. bill that passed was like private marijuana banks. They did not gain access to Fed, so nothing has happened with that. The other push we saw was to create a state-owned bank, but only to serve the marijuana industry. And we right. argued on both of those that it's a federal law that you're fighting so right. if you don't have access to the Fed and Federal Reserve cannot give an illegal entity access to the Fed window, this doesn't work and you are a big vault and you're still completely cash based. Right. So although so, the although they have multiple different branches or, or individuals banking with them, it's it still would e equate to be a vault because they wouldn't get the security or the FDIC insurance that that a normal bank would. Right. And without access to the payment system, yeah. you can write checks off of an account. You're still yeah. like here's your cash. That's all you could do was transfer for cash, basically. So um, thank God that has eased up and changed a bit. We actually had uh, marijuana industries paying their taxes, their state taxes in cash, and they were oh. taking cash down, yeah, to the Department of Revenue. In fact, the Department of Revenue had to train people to be tellers and had to put in vaults because they're not used to receiving cash. That's interesting. I mean, you hear you hear the clickbait stories about people paying their taxes in pennies and, and stuff like that. But I guess this this makes sense that that if they're they can't bank, they can't run transactions. That they're stuck in a cash only business. That makes, yeah. that makes a lot of sense to me. What was fascinating for federal taxes, they had to go get postal money orders, which is hilarious <laughs> that they could get a postal money order with, with the funds to pay right. tax on a federally <laughs> illegal entity. And, and that's how they would pay their federal taxes is by getting postal money orders, which <laughs> again, it's crazy. That That's that's pretty interesting. I I would never would have guessed like that. That's, yeah. a, whole new, that's a whole new thing to me. So then yeah. as, as we were discussing kind of topics for today, you mentioned something called safer. Mm hmm. Give me a little bit of background to this. What is this and, and then how is this going to impact Colorado banks? So SAFER is uh, the most recent version of the Federal Safe Banking Act mm -hmm. that allows institutions to bank marijuana in states where it's legal. Mm -hmm. So in Colorado, it may not have that much impact, to be honest. We have 35 credit unions and banks that now serve the industry. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about how they do that later. I don't know that everybody's going to want to serve the marijuana industry because it's always going to be compliance heavy. Right. Um, just like not everybody serves adult entertainment, not everybody right. serves casinos, all of that. Yeah. So we may not have that many more banks jump in. What I like about it, I think it gives some protection to banks that are accidentally or unknowingly banking marijuana. And okay. we have a lot of that going on. A lot of um, marijuana businesses would open accounts as a day spa or a bakery or use all sorts of false names. And it took takes right. a while for the bank to figure it out. I think it, everything. Yeah. yeah, I think it gives them some protection. 
as far as I know, Colorado has more financial institutions serving the marijuana industry than any other state. That's why I say I'm not sure safer will impact Colorado that much. We're still lobbying for it. I still think it's a good law. Would love to get it across the finish line. Um, I think this will be its eighth year or ninth year working on it in Congress. Okay. So then you mentioned that the you were going to get back to how, how banks and credit unions service the, the, the marijuana industry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy intense as, from a compliance perspective. So they do it with the knowledge, not quite approval, but knowledge of their federal regulator. Um, they have to do in-person visits, usually quarterly, to the marijuana business. You have to account for every penny in that business and every penny leaving that business. So it's, it's just very intense. And then you have to have a lot of specialization and you have to have employees that recognize this is out of the bounds of normal for a marijuana business. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple news stories where um, uh, some Colombian individuals who are, who are rather iffy were involved in the marijuana business and, and that's not legal and, and a bank was serving them. So there were some problems there. So it takes a lot of expertise. And it's very expensive and banks charge for that expertise. So it's very expensive for the marijuana related business also. So then how do you, if you had a bank that, that was looking at, at getting involved in, in this, how, how would they go about it? Or is it more one of those things that's like, hey, look, like it's, it's best to, to kind of avoid this if you don't have experience. In it. What, what would you suggest around those? So, and, and we never weigh in on whether a bank should or should not bank it. If a bank is considering Perfect. it, right. the first thing you need to do is talk to your board and you need to make sure your board is willing to accept that additional risk because it's still a federally illegal activity. Right. So if someone chose to enforce the federal law, you would have to get rid of those deposits. Mm -hmm. And I say deposits because we're not seeing many banks lend. We're starting to see banks lend like on a strip mall that may have a tenant, but you don't see broad lending um, to the marijuana industry right now. Um, then you need to inform your regulators that you're planning on doing it. And some banks have been told no, the regulator just isn't comfortable with a bank taking on that risk profile. And then you have to have the expense of training your staff and, and determining what amount you're going to allow because you don't want a concentration. I've heard regulators are watching for that. They right. don't want a concentration of marijuana funds in the bank in case those funds have to leave the bank. Yeah, so. in case they're given the time frame where they say, hey, like get rid of the accounts and then that's that. Right, right. You, you don't want the bank depending on it from a liquidity perspective. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for letting me let me pick your brain about the the whole marijuana side of the industry. That that's not something that I've had the chance to to spend any any real time in and everything. So it's really interesting to hear it from your perspective. The one other fun fact I would throw out, I should say fun fact that I throw out. <laughs> um, my friend Lori from Arkansas always does fun fact. Um, Colorado made three hundred and twenty-two million dollars in taxes from marijuana last okay. year. That's twenty-two numbers. So it is serious business in Colorado. Okay, that, um, that, is, that, that is a very interesting number to hear. Yeah, so I, I wanted to include that. It's not a small business. It's real money. It's real business in the state. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense why why so many banks or, or a chunk of banks have, have looked at it, get into it, because obviously somewhere along the road, they're determining that, that it's that it's worth the effort for them to, to get those deposits and, and everything like that. So that's, that's very interesting right. to hear those numbers. So then I, I did want to give you an opportunity before we, we wrap up and, and kind of end the, the, the podcast. If you could give one piece of advice to, to our listeners today, and it doesn't have to be about marijuana or, or anything like that. It can just be from, from your background. What, what piece of advice would you give our listeners? Well, I'm going to be selfish with this one, and I would encourage banks to follow their banking association closely regarding legislative matters, because what public officials are doing is impacting the industry. We need more bankers engaged to help promote the economy and the banking industry as whole. So that's a selfish plug for SBAs, <laughs> but, but that would be my advice. I'm, I'm surprised from time to time how... Um, Bankers often don't know the bills that are either defeated or in the works that that banking associations are working on. So I will say that that amongst all the the people that I have interviewed, that that's a, a fairly common trend is get involved, <laughs> know know yeah. what your the, the the laws that are coming up, know how they're they're going to affect you, and and get involved in the process because it's only by getting involved in the process, no matter which side you're on, whether you're for or against something, it's only by getting involved in the process that you can impact something or make a difference. 
Otherwise, you just sit there on your hands and put them in your thoughts. Very true. Very true. Well, Jen, I really appreciate you taking time to speak with me and taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you very much. Happy to. It was great to visit with you. For the rest of our listeners, that's Banking Matters. 